As it rapidly approaches, this spectacular event impacts the very fabric of space and time. We call it the holidays. Fortunately, Sarah at the Container Store can help. Uh, hi. As time runs out, how do you manage? Well, we offer a huge selection of gift wrap, including our gift wrap three packs, now 50% off. You get three high-quality rolls of wrap for just $4.99. Plus, our stocking stuffers are up to 50% off, too. Sarah, savior of time and the holidays. Or just Sarah. The Container Store, where space comes from. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. This coming February is the 30th anniversary of Gotham by Gaslight. Did you know that? That is the story that ushered in the DC Elseworld series. And uh, we're going to talk to uh, a guy that uh, was the writer of that very first Elseworlds, Gotham by Gaslight, Brian Augustin. Really excited to talk to him about uh, that and also Archie 1941, his current series for Archie which in a lot of ways uh, I think shares some uh, reasonable brain shelf space uh, along with Gotham by Gaslight because it puts the core Archie characters back in their origin period. Pep Comics uh, first featured Archie back in December of 1941 and we got to know the Riverdale group and this is a really interesting story because of course December 1941, Pearl Harbor, World War II, America's involvement in World War II begins and uh, how does it affect the Riverdale gang? Very interesting stuff. It's, uh, it's certainly not a comedy. It's a, it's a great drama and a wonderful soap opera. And I think a fitting setting to put the uh, Archie guys and women in and see them react to the real world of uh, 1941 and the choices that World War II made a lot of civilians make. Then you'll get the lowdown on DC Elseworlds and Gotham by Gaslight, Gotham by Gaslight's sequel, that featured Eduardo Barreto, of course, the original Gotham by Gaslight, drawn by Mike Mignola and written by Brian, edited by Mark Wade. We get the whole lowdown on the creation of Gotham by Gaslight, the subsequent series as well, and, uh, you know, the third uh, volume that never happened. How about that? Neat stuff. The uh, Birth of Elseworlds and Archie 1941 with uh, Brian Augustin on today's Word Balloon. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you very much, League, for your support. It's the beginning of the month, and I thank you for your subscriptions to Word Balloon. Uh, You are keeping the lights on, and you are uh, keeping me mobile as well and getting me to other cities so I can make uh, interesting connections and uh, line up new and future Word Balloon episodes and try to continue to innovate the Word Balloon network and uh, bring you more than uh, what I'm currently bringing you. Uh, I'm, I've been happy with the amount of Word Balloon podcast episodes that have been coming out lately and also the Big Bout podcast, the new boxing podcast, part of Word Balloon Network. Oh, yeah, podcast with Art, Artie and Franco and Scoot and Mike. Uh, you know, we, we bring you episodes when we can. Uh, it's tough to get uh, three or four of us in a room, let alone five of us, and uh, we do our best. So uh, I hope you'll uh, stick with the Ah Yeah podcast, the infrequent Ah Yeah podcast, but dedicated. So again, thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. If you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, if you think the entertainment I'm trying to bring you each month is uh, worth your while, it'd be great if you subscribe via Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Word Balloon, or you can click on the Patreon ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Lightning Strikes Comics, the Irish comic book publisher behind such titles as The Life and Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Prince Valiant's 80th Anniversary Magazine, Highlander, the Commemorative Movie Magazine. They're pleased to announce a new series, The Phantom Strikes. It features the art of the great Alex Saviak of Spider-Man fame and a new original story by David Williams. The Phantom Strikes also features contributions by artist Mike Collins and many more. To order copies, you can visit lightningstrikecomics.com, and retailers can make bulk orders by emailing info at lightningstrikecomics.com. Lightning Strike has also teamed up with the longest-running Phantom Comic publisher, Fru Comics, to offer you more titles featuring The Ghost Who Walks, including, for younger audiences, Kid Phantom, number one, and the trade paperback of The Phantom's earliest stories, For those who came in late, other titles such as the award-winning creator-owned anthology series Lightning Strikes Presents, that's also available online at lightningstrikecomics.com and available on Comixology now. Check it out, go to their website, and find out more, lightningstrikecomics.com.
All right, without further ado, let's get into our talk with Brian Augustine. Man, I'll tell you, we're, we're just weeks away from the big DC uh, TV crossover of Elseworlds, and uh, we're talking to the writer that wrote the very first one, the writer of Gotham by Gaslight and the current Archie 1941, Brian Augustine on Word Balloon. Brian Augustine, welcome to Word Balloon. It's it's a pleasure to talk to you, man. A, a longtime reader and uh, thrilled with uh, your past work and, and certainly what you're doing right now with Archie in 1941. Well, thanks, John. That's a, that's a lot of nice things to say at the start. I hope it doesn't go down from here, <laughs> but I'm glad to be here. It can't. Glad to be here. It can't. Um, this is really a cool project, and uh, I, I know – well, you, you know, it's funny. I talked to Mark Waite about it a couple months ago. Your your mm -hmm. your usual collaborator and on many projects over the years, um, but tell me how how did this happen? Well, the project has its I think its its absolute origin, its ground zero moment in the Archie offices. Um, without any of us present, someone said, "You know, I was just looking at the uh, stats about our previous publishing history, and Archie uh, was first day uh, first debuted in comics in December of 1941." And and that person said, you know what else happened in December of 1941? Yeah. And because, you know, they're all born in the 1970s, they said, <laughs> uh, no, what? Uh, no. But someone, someone, I think, had a brilliant idea. Um, Mike Pellerito is the co-president and the editor we've dealt with, and I'm going to give him credit, but it may not be. But somebody had a great uh, idea that it would be interesting to to take – Archie from that sort of outside that envelope outside of reality that he's existed in for 70. I can't do the math 77, something like that years. Sounds right. And sort of write the stories as if they took place during the, the actual time frame in which Archie and his gang were introduced. And as it, uh, as it fleshed out, they went to Wade who was already writing their main title uh, and Mark, as you may have noticed, does a couple of other things here and there. And uh, he also knew as a historical project that it might be something he and I would have fun doing together. I'm a big history buff. So they, they, brought, they brought us in and uh, and we said, yeah, it sounds really cool. Did you want us to keep it comedic? And somebody else said, do you know what else happened in December? And we And we did, but I didn't, you know, we weren't sure that Archie as a, as a company would want us to stray too far from what they normally do with their characters. But they said, no, it should be a drama. And so there we are, we are off, off and running and, uh, you know, research and, and, you know, going back and, you know, remembering things that our parents and, and grandparents had told us of that period, um, really gave us, I think, um, a strong, through line that we could just frankly string along on and uh and the rest as i say is a history about history i'm enjoying it man and so, i uh, yeah i i think it's uh i i'm glad it's it's taking such a serious take um i i also you know figure that with the success of riverdale uh, but even before that you know really in the last 10 or 15 years Archie has been a lot more ambitious, uh, going beyond the classic uh, Dan DiCarlo and Stan Goldberg, and n nothing wrong with that. I mean, the formulas work. No, for absolutely. Some years. We but all it, grew up on that. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's fun to see um, these kind of ambitious stories coming from Archie, and and again, yeah, what what a perfect thing. I, also, Peter Krause, my God, uh, he could not be more Norman Rockwellian. <laughs> what he's doing but it's it's fantastic I agree. Man. I agree. yeah really fits man it's a it's a great the art has a great tone and it is it's this really interesting somber setting that um much like uh well in a different way what michael uslin did with uh the life with archie and did the married life and i and i really thought kind of just a really interesting kind of soap opera moments with that series mm -hmm. so so no i yeah i think uh archie is kind of a perfect uh, metaphor for what was going on in the home front, because yeah, these these teenagers uh, suddenly find themselves 
at at the start of uh, World War II and and have to make well, some living tough reality. life choices. Yeah, you make, living reality and making some tough life choices. And that's the other thing. Just watching the core group and I mean, we're we're two issues in, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not like they all did that classic uh, you know w- war movie propaganda. We're all going to sign up. I mean, I think a lot of them wanted to, but I mean, God, we see of all people, Moose being four F. And he can't join. That's that's amazing. And uh, and Archie just kind of struggling and not being the happy go lucky uh, kid uh, during this very tough period. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to open as we did in issue one with high school graduation. High school has always been the setting for Archie. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, Riverdale, the town, but high school is in many ways we were thinking of it as that's their safe place. That's everything that keeps them from having to deal with drama as it even to this day i i would hope that high school students are living you know just shy of what's about to happen in adulthood and we wanted to open it with the graduation we wanted to take them out of high school which doesn't happen very often for archie uh, obviously if he grew grew up and got married and, and my dear's and stuff he got out of high school we assume uh, or a ged i don't know um but we wanted to open with that as a symbol this is the the end of innocence uh, that first issue is the last summer, and Archie's not just struggling with with what's going to happen in Europe or with the war. He's also struggling with what he should be. He spent so much time not being an adult. What does it mean? And so that was the his first struggle. Um, he's at odds with his with his his dad. Um, you know, lots of expectations. Uh, we certainly, you know. On some level, we have our, our helicopter, our helicopter parents to this day, tiger moms and dad and so on. Uh, I would imagine no less um, from, you know, what my parents have told me was the expectation that you would do something. Now, back then, I would think mostly it was get a job. Sure. College was, I think, it was probably less um, an obvious choice, although many did take it. But um we wanted to graduate them and then put them on this journey to adulthood in whichever branch that was going to take them. So yes, Jug, Jughead wants to go and his father won't let him. Moose is dying to go and he can't, uh, and so on. And, uh, and Archie struggles with what he wants to do and makes his choices when he finally realizes what is and isn't expected of him. We also wanted to, you know, start moving them into other adult, you know, like, for instance, relationships with each other are changing and growing, yeah. evolving. Uh, we settle the question, uh, Archie, you know, for Archie, Betty or Veronica, the only way that it should ever be solved. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's like the Ginger Marianne yeah. question, but I, I do understand. And and yeah, no, I, Betty's Betty is steady and, and absolutely. And of course. You know, it it's it is that classic girl next door. They fall in love, but yeah, now now Betty is you know unfortunately because of Sir, you know Archie and Liz, and and I love that moment of you'll wait for me, won't you? And and yeah, so now Betty's you know on the home front, and also Veronica. Um, that's really interesting because there is that whole being a, a, a society woman, uh, and and we'll see how you know, the war might impact her because I think I've been reading like a, a great John Wayne biography that Scott Iman did. And, you know, mm-hmm. there are just these moments of like John Wayne, even like dealing with society people at the start of the war. And, and you, you know, you do get this like kind of this detachment uh, and, and, you know, Veronica still live in the society life and everything. And even though her dad is out working on missions, we don't know exactly what he's doing. Um, yeah, I have a feeling. I have a feeling something bad might be around the corner for Veronica. Obviously, well, it, there are realizations that they will come to all of them, and and in multi stages. Um, we we play up the traditional tension between, say, for instance, Betty and Veronica. You know, not only are they competitors, but you know they're definitely different parts of the of of the divide, if you will, in town. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's not just that Veronica is a, a you know, a, a young lady of, of the world. Um, in the first little bits and pieces, it doesn't look like she's paying any attention to the world. Right. And, 
And to this day, we know people like that who don't have to. Right. You know, they don't have to think. They don't have to worry too much about it. Their life is pretty much insured, uh, insulated, and secured. And um, and she's going to be she's going to be growing up. I mean, they asked us to make them real people as much as possible, and it's still a comic book. Sure. And it's still the the shorthand of storytelling like that. But we wanted to give them all, not just the teens either, but the adults, um, some you know some level of of growth or uh, evolution, or in the case of the kids, uh, you know maturation. Um, you know, so Betty and Archie come to a place where they realize it's not it's not uh, you know puppy love. Right. It's it's coming up to be something very real and the, the, uh, the war and the separation will test them. Um, Veronica never takes Archie seriously. She just wants what anybody else wants. So, you know, in our, in our, in our telling anyway, mm-hmm. her interest in Archie is simply, I can't have him. Um, and to, and to, you know, to trump the other girl, and, you know, if they're rivals, sure. Um, but Jughead has to grow, has to deal. Jughead's also the one he leaves behind. So, um, you know, friendship, uh, relationships, parent, children. Um, and, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to spoil anything, but everybody no, no. has, you know, some moments. And, and Mark and I agreed that we wanted to start with where you expect to find them in a way and then give everybody a little bit of, of a, a chance to shine. So, you know, Veronica, even Reggie, yeah, will have his moment. Well, so. I, I like their initial conflict on the beach that happens in that first issue, and and it's a kind of well, it starts to be kind of a classic, you know, argument, and then it gets ugly because Archie obviously is going through all this, you know, uh, questions about what he's going to do with himself, and really just you know beats the house. Beats the hell out of Reggie, and then also they have a very adult moment of, "Hey, man, you know, no hard feelings," and they both kind of see that, yeah, the real world is coming, and that you know these kind of uh, trivial things don't really matter as far as the big picture goes. And that's the thing, man. It's like, okay, you know, where there usually would be a moment of comedy or something like that. It's like, yeah, no, this is a different story. It's like, yeah, we uh, we got some serious stuff going on, and also got Fred, uh, Archie's dad. Um, this is great. And again, I mean, you know, there, there's always been like, you know, classic father and son kind of hijink kind of, you know, humor. But that's the thing, man. Now you really appreciate the, the complexity of the situation. And, you know, Fred wants the best for his son. He wants to protect his son. He also wants his son to grow up and be a man. And there's that great almost like the graduate. If that's what if, I mean, 20 years later, obviously, or 25 years later. <laughs> but, yeah, it felt like, you know, kind of a Benjamin Braddock kind of moment of. You know, what are you doing with your life, kid? I mean, you know, what what are you doing when he's when he's uh, watering the lawn and kind of staring off into space and stuff? So, yeah, I know we we, we get those moments like the the Reggie Reggie Archie conflict on the beach starts, as you say, with a typical comedy bit. Reggie smacks Archie full in the face with a giant beach ball, (laughs) uh, which causes Archie to lose what little remains of his ice cream cone. And. I think for 70, however many years it's been, we've been waiting for that moment. Um, it's catharsis uh, sure. in a lot of ways. It's Reggie finally gets his. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The bully finally gets his. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, in the second issue, when they run into each other on the street, well, Archie is soul seeking and they're coming from the theater of uh, Reggie and Veronica, who aren't an item, but Reggie, it seems, would like them to be. Um, and realizes exactly what his place is. It's kind of, he's a spirit carrier for Veronica in that little bit of conversation. And you're right. He, we did give them a kind of, sorry about it. I kind of blew up and Reggie's response was, Oh, I, I think I got it. I had it coming. Yeah. And again, like so, you said, they, they abandoned Veronica too. They both kind of go their own ways. And she's just like, wait a minute. Somebody, <laughs> isn't anyone going to escort me home? And again, that's classic kind of rich girl, uh, Veronica kind of attitude that, like I said, it, 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 it It'll be very interesting to see how the story develops for all of them. Well, but, you you, you will know. be pleased. Uh, I will tell you, you'll be pleased. Okay. Um, her evolution, I think we gave her probably more evolution simply because she 
has grown up expecting to be the top of everything realizes fairly quickly uh, she's not even the top when it comes to how to the home because dad is off making millions or more millions. Um, and, you know, she's she's been raised essentially by money and not so much connection to her father. So, you know, she's got a lot of uh, moments of growing up and some nice catharsis of her own and realizations. And, uh, and uh, you know, the evolution of her relationship with Betty is very interesting as far as as far as we as we can tell, but you know we're on the inside. Sure, man, that's cool. Six issues or five issues? It is five issues. Okay, okay. And and I don't know. Do you know when issue three is coming out? It's obviously this month, November, coming up. It, yes, it does come up. Uh, I would say um, second week. I think it is of of November. Okay. Um, I know it went to press today. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so, because we did the final proofs. Um. So yeah, I mean we're we're ahead of time and and uh, on time and um, they run a very efficient uh, you know production machine and it'll it'll be out in what is that three weeks something like that. So, okay, yeah, that's cool. Is um and I will say I will say also that you know not only are we on time because Mark and I grew up knowing how to meet deadlines, but also uh, P Cross saves us in time every every time and on top of it he makes the script look about eight times better it's really so, beautiful man absolutely i and forgive me i don't have the book in front of me Who who's your colorist is pete coloring it as well kelly kelly fitzgerald she's been doing oh well, she's been coloring for a lot of folks but she's been the go-to uh and rightfully so for a lot of the archie uh the various and sundry archie titles i don't know if she colors the archie uh name title or not, but I know she, she does uh, a lot of that. She does. I've seen her credits on Marvel and DC, um, really talented and very definitely collaborating with, with Pete and, uh, and with the script to find ways to set the tone. It's, it's often bright as you would expect an Archie comic to be, but, um, she can do mood, um, as good as I've ever seen. Agreed. Absolutely, man. And have you gotten any reader feedback yet? I mean, like I said, there's been two issues so far. But have you have you seen anything? Has have people, you know, talked to you via social media or whatever and let you know what they think of it? Absolutely. Um, every time there is either a promotion or a release, my my Twitter feed fills up with happy people. I'm glad to say. Excuse me. But um, I've had messages, um, Facebook and otherwise. And I would say 99% positive. Uh, you know, Mark is, you know, we'll be focusing on that 1%, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. Reviews have been very solid um, by people who have, getting, have gotten that we are, are shooting for something that is mature, um, at least in, you know, as that means more adult themes, more, more realistic uh, emotions and and so on. Um, in fact, that's one of the things people have uh, have have been remarking remarking on most positively was we like that you trust the characters to be grown up. And uh, you know, it's the the benefit of working on some of these very established characters like Superman or Batman or or Archie where we know them, we know the baseline of those characters and gives us a lot of freedom then to, to play there without going far from the baseline. Um, that should, uh, he should always be and remind you of Archie. He's still a bit of a clutch. He's still a bit of a waffler and maybe even a little bit lazy here and there, or at least indecisive. Jughead still eats a lot and, and, <laughs> Reggie is still a little bit of a bully. Betty is sweet and Veronica is rich and all the things, you know, and then we just do a sort of, you know, that plus, um, but it's been great. And, uh, you know, some of my favorite and most rewarding stuff has been the p working the adults and some of the side characters. So, you know, Moose doesn't have a whole lot, but what he does have is pretty dramatic. Um, issue three has a nice scene with him and Chuck. Yeah, I can tell the, from the tease. Yes, go on. The African-American uh, 
kid who is blocked from this is not a spoiler. I'll just tell you the setup. He's blocked from uh, going to the recruitment center. Wow. By bullies. Oh, geez. Yeah. So we get into a little of that. And very much we wanted Riverdale itself to be a character. So the people of Riverdale, we meet people. Um, you know, I don't think we've ever seen Moose's mom, but there's Moose's mom. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, yeah. People who own businesses in the area. They may have one or two lines, but they're there. Um, and Fred and Mary. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Archie's parents, definitely. And, Archie, and in number three, we discover a tension has occurred between mom and dad because Archie enlisted. Cool. So, Wow. Well, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm really interested, My I, and I'm, I, I'm interested in your own family's experience with World War II. My father... Uh, went into the army and went into basic during 45 and was preparing mm -hmm. for the land invasion of Japan if the bomb didn't work and it was going to be right. Operation Olympia or whatever. And I always remind my sister, it's like, you know, thank God. I mean, it's terrible because of the destruction that happened of the atomic bomb, but the land invasion of Japan could have been another D-Day in terms of you right. know, mortality and everything. And I'm like, you know, we may not have been there if things had gone the way they planned. So instead, he went uh, to the occupation of Germany and was in Vienna. And I remember as uh, when I hit my high school years, my dad said, do you want to see what the war was like for me? And I said, sure. And he said, we're going to watch a movie. And we watched The, th the Third Man, the Carol Reed movie with <laughs> Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. And he said yeah. he, he, was a, he was an MP. Uh, for the American territory, and he said, yeah, we were dealing with the black marketers and all this devastation that you see. This was exactly what Vienna was like, and it was really eye-opening. So, And again, I had uncles that did serve in World War II, and I wonder if um, the younger generation – you know, World War, World War II was 70 years ago, as, as we said, and um, also just the idea of war has gone away from being that home front concern the way that – Unfortunately, and it's not just one administration you can point to. This has been going on, God, really since the 80s, where any sort of conflict that we have really becomes compartmentalized to the point where, you know, there just isn't that same feeling of there's a detachment unless you've got somebody that was serving, you know, during some of, you know, the conflicts from Grenada to the Iraq wars uh, to Afghanistan and beyond. I mean, you know, where, where we are today. And and I just you know that's it's that's another w interesting wrinkle about this story, as you say, that R Riverdale is going to be such a big character, is how World War II affected the American home front as much, uh, it, well, in different ways. But you know there there are stories to be told, both on the home front and certainly on on the front lines as well. Certainly, uh, well, my my uh, my family missed World War II essentially. Okay, I mean, they didn't. They were around for its existence, but my grandfather um, was too young for World War One and too old for World War Two. Wow! Um, my dad served in uh, the Korean War. Sure, um, but he worked out of an office building in Seoul okay. as a clerk. <laughs> sure. So behind the front lines, there are no there are no real war stories. Now, my grandmother and grandfather. My grandfather was, as I say. Um, I mean, I, he he had to register. He did register, but he was 48, and um, I think that's right. No, he was 45. And uh, and while he waited for a call up, the the call up at that level never happened. And uh, so he went to work in a war plant, um, working. He was a you know an engineer working with um, the the manufacturer of guns. Okay. So he he. He worked on the uh, whatever the stamping process would have been for creating gun stocks and and uh, wooden parts and uh, metal fabrication. So he worked on that. But my grandmother was a Rosie the Riveter. That's great. So now not working on planes, but working on uh, on um, in a plant that turned out essentially jeeps, I guess. And so you know they were. Participants, to be sure. In fact, my grandfather has a commendation from President Roosevelt. Wow, that's fantastic! Because he, yeah, please. He, uh, 
he got a medal uh, and a letter of commendation from the president. He uh, he was not officially uh, an engineer. He was not a trained engineer, uh, but he was a, a craft. You know, uh, what do they call master craftsman? A a cabinet maker. Uh, he knew how to work with tools. He knew how to work with cutting tools. And uh, he was watching, overseeing the the line as it stamped out gun parts, the stock and the uh, grip, and watched it happen one stamp, one stamp, one stamp. And apparently, as, as it's told to me by my by my mom, he went home and doodled for about a week and went back and when they were shut down overnight, he refigured the machine to cut six at a time. Wow. So. Yeah. It doesn't sound like a lot, but increasing the output by uh, sixfold was uh, was a big deal, especially since, you know, given the, the size of our of our forces over there, um, you know, gun parts and, and guns sure. and. Replacement equipment was always in demand. So, no, that's um, huge, man. Well, and and also again, these are like the kind of little wrinkles about World War II that you know maybe the general public isn't aware of. But really, I mean, we really built our arsenal for World War II. We prior to World War II, we weren't even you know in the top five, if not even lower than the. I think we were lower than the top ten as far as army readiness prior to right. the war effort, and really. Roosevelt and all the manufacturers really had to like stand up and go, okay, we've never done this before, and certainly not at this level. We're, you know, uh, all the automotive plants. You're now in the war business. My aunt, my dad's older oldest sister, um, she she had a great moment at the library when she was watching an actress uh, ex- do a demonstration and a reenactment and basically portrayed a Rosie the Riveter. And it really dawned mm-hmm. on my aunt because she worked for Western Electric that was making – they were making telephones prior to the war. And then they switched to radar equipment. And she said, oh, my God, I was a Rosie the Riveter. I never really thought of myself that way. And she was telling me this just a couple of years ago. And I'm and her name was Anita. And I'm like, well, yeah, Anita, of course you were. And she said, well, you know, you always see like a woman on a scaffold, you know, literally riveting, you know, things onto a ship or something like that. And she said, you know, I never really thought of myself that way, but I, I was. And I'm like, yeah, of course you were. And and really, you know, I mean, she knew she she had worked for the war effort, just never really thought of herself that way. I look forward to, I, I imagine we'll see examples of this in the in the miniseries as well. Had had we one more issue, Mary would have been working in a war plant, but we oh, we never got to work that in. So Interesting. Um, it's how she was going to stay busy. Sure. Um, but... There were things that we just sadly didn't get to. Okay. Um, right. I will I will say just since you mentioned it, my, my uncle worked until his retirement, and it's my mom's uh, brother-in-law, uh, for Western Electric. And he got his job because during World War – well, in the late 40s, after World War II. Okay. Uh, he, he worked on the Dew Line. He was a radar tech. And um, watching for – I guess enemy planes coming up over the North Pole, and and because that was their equipment they were using, something there led to his going to work at Western Electric when he got back home to Illinois. So, wow, small world. I'm telling you, yeah, I was surprised when we were exchanging emails. You you said that you grew up in Chicago, and I was going to ask if uh, how how many generations uh, prior to yours, you know, if if you know your family was here in Chicago as well, and everybody grew up around here? My dad was first generation. Um, his parents, my my grandparents on that side, uh, came from Poland in 1929. Okay. And uh, my, my mom and my grandparents came to Chicago in 1950. So um, my mom had just graduated from high school. Very cool. That's so, excellent, man. Yeah, my my dad and uh, they they live first on the north side and then settle on the south side. Oh, okay. Because yeah, I'm a, I'm a north sider myself. Um, uh, my uh, my and it's funny because my parent or I should say my father's uh, family, uh, they were around where uh, University of uh, Chicago's uh, Circle Campus was and uh, grew up uh, in a predominantly Italian neighborhood. We were, were Greek, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it was you know Taylor <laughs> Taylor Street was our. Uh, 
was where uh, my yeah no was no from. don't don't start me I'll be drooling if I think about Taylor Street for too yeah. long I hear you man absolutely <laughs> God, God bless the fact that in the Phoenix area where we are enough Chicago immigrants have come out here yes indeed. I don't even think it should be called immigrants but there are plenty of <laughs> transplants and I can get Italian beef I can get Chicago pizza I can get Chicago dogs out of what that's good. <laughs> I was I mean, laughing. I, you know, I lived out on the East Coast for years when I was working at D.C., and almost none of that was available unless I had it sent to me or when we went home to visit. But uh, I followed my mom out here, and now we're we're staying. But, you know, it might be a different issue if I didn't have the uh, immediate access to Italian beef and so on and so forth. <laughs> no, I understand. I, I was looking. I think I saw something you said on, uh, I want to say, Facebook about um, – I forget what horror movie it was you saw in Creature Features, and I'm and I'm guessing that was WGN uh, Creature yeah. Features back in the day. And certainly, yep. I was I was wa- we're we're about ten years apart, I think, in age. And uh, yeah, I was watching that, <laughs> those same channels and stuff. So I uh, I could appreciate. Well, that. Creature Features is around from the early '60s to the middle '70s, probably. So yes, yes, yeah. I mean, I, I'm assuming that I'm ten years older, not indeed. younger, right? Yeah, no, ten years <laughs> older. Yeah, yeah. But that's all right. Close enough, man. You know, I uh, I I had uh, Sven Gulli, the son of Sven Gulli, uh, on uh, Rich on his, Kaz. Yes, indeed, Rich Kaz. He's a great guy. But I remember Jerry G. Bishop. I remember when he was first doing Sven Gulli, and uh, you know, it, <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. I, and and you know, I I have a I'm a, I'm in Chicago broadcasting, so uh, sure. no, it, it's been a lot of fun getting to meet a lot of uh, the people that uh, you know were were getting started when I was a little kid and everything, and I've had a chance to work with a lot of them before they retired as well. In fact, Regine Schlesinger, this wonderful news reporter at mm-hmm. WBBM News Radio, uh, just retired uh, last week, and I had the pleasure of working with her her last couple of years, and it was really like, I, I'm like, I can't believe I'm working with Regine Schlesinger. This is great. Tommy Edwards uh, uh, from uh, WLS uh, Rock and Roll Days and Larry Lujak, I got a chance to meet him, and, you know. <laughs> You know, yeah, exactly. This is Chicago Tommy, broadcasting what stuff. Was, there. What was it? Was that Tommy his sidekick, or yes, on Animal Stories, little snot nosed Tommy, <laughs> <laughs> little Tommy, exactly. Yeah, I remember <laughs> Bob Serrano, Uncle Lair, Uncle Lair, absolutely, yeah. man, and uh, WCFL, which was the Chicago Federation of Labor, and he would say mm-hmm. three o'clock, Larry Lujak from the Voice of Labor. And I never knew what that meant until I was like a little older. And I'm like, oh, it's it's a union station. I had no idea. That's awesome, man. They the union owned the station. In so. the 1960s, that was in their jingle. Yes. Yes, the into the 70s of too. Labor, something yes. like that. Yeah. Oh my God, no, absolutely, man. And you had the big top 40 awards between WCFL and uh, WLS. So oh, LS yeah. was the giant. They were the big. Yes. 500,000 or 50,000 or whatever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The big ABC station in Chicago. And, yeah, and a very important station in the, in broadcast history and stuff. No, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, you know, CFL was the upstart. And they, I think I think Larry started at, I want to say, LS, and then he moved to CFL. I that's could true. be wrong. Yep. Okay, there no, you no, go. No, no, that's the direction they went. And uh, and also, oh, my God, and now I'm blanking on his name, uh, a great old top 40 DJ. Uh, from the '60s, the guy who who sang on top of a pizza. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Dick, Bi- Dick Biondi. Dick Biondi, of course. Dick Biondi had a, had a chance to meet him a couple of times. Great guy. He just retired in the last couple of years. He kept going, man. Long time. He would. He was doing internet radio for a while. Yes, he was. Absolutely. Yep. No, it's yeah, it's I'm, crazy. I wanted to go into radio in the 1960s. I thought I would. Oh and wow! Didn't. I didn't, but I wanted to, and I wanted to be a DJ. So my heroes were Blue Jack, and now I'm going to go blank trying to think of some of the guys I grew up with. But uh, but there was a, a full dial full of people like uh, Biondi or Clark Weber or sure um, Barney Pip was one of my favorites. Hilarious. Turn him into peanut remember. butter. Oh, Barney, what was that about peanut butter? Say it again. <laughs> Turn him into peanut butter. That was his call for some reason. <laughs> followed by followed by a live on air badly played couple notes on a trumpet. Oh so, wow. That now I <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean again, it was that second wave of um 
you know, obviously rock and roll in the 50s and everything and the, the boss DJs of the 50s. But that, that tradition continued into the 60s and even into the early 70s. So, yeah. Sure. Sure. You know, and it's man, I'll tell you, for someone who did get into radio, uh, it's a completely different world than the world I was hoping to join when I was in school. <laughs> and you I know, imagine. For, yeah, for better and for worse. But yeah, it's uh, very interesting times, unfortunately, in radio as as it kind of readjusts, just like it had to uh, back with the advent of television and everything. I mean, it's yeah, uh, ra- it'll be very interesting to see what radio looks like about ten years from now. Uh, and as, I feel very fortunate. Someone... Go ahead. As someone who works in in comic books, I know all about what it is to be in passe pass technology well, that is somehow go. still alive. Yeah. Well, but you know, but, I'm gl- go on. Yeah. No, I was going to say I still follow, uh, you know, radio to the degree um, that I can, mostly on the internet. Um, I was, you know, I stayed uh, following Steve Dahl, for instance. Sure. Um, and he's stepping down at the end of the year. I don't know if you heard that as far as his radio I did show. hear it, yes. I Isn't go to his crazy? website. Yeah. Well, oh he's my, my he's a year or two older than I am, so I hope he does. But I, um, Well, you know, and I, I get it. I understand, you know, and and also I think it was kind of uphill for Steve Donald. Steve Donald, for, for people who don't know, really funny radio host. Um, and uh, He was Howard you know, Stern before Howard Stern was Howard Stern. I'm glad you said it, Brian. I know. And, and you're right. He was. Uh, and it's... Uh, even even Stern will begrudgingly admit that Steve Dahl was doing, you know, and, and doing it in Detroit before Howard Stern had really got things going in Det- Detroit before he blew up in Washington and New York and the like. So, yeah, it's uh, he's he's a great guy. I've 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 known Steve for, you know, about 20 some years, really, since the 90s. And um, I'm glad he's doing well on the Internet. And I do think that he'll be fine and will continue to entertain through his podcast. And it's been fun watching what he's doing with his podcast and what I do, try to do with Word Balloon. Uh, but, mm. yeah, I think a lot of uh, Chicago transplants still support his podcast and love hearing him. So, again, well, it's, it's the change. Me. Well, there you go, man. And, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's the uh, the changing face of radio. And, and I think, luckily, podcasting is going to be uh, a nice escape hatch for a lot of talented audio people that can still do it. It's just uh, the business model is changing as far as radio goes. And so, right. you know, the smart people and the, and the talented people are able to go to podcasting. There's another great guy from the West Coast, Phil Hendry. You know that guy? I know that name. He is, he is a genius. He is really uh, an amazing guy, and he has thrived in podcasting as well after being so successful and just a real radio comedy genius. I got to talk to Phil Proctor, one of the Firesign Theater guys. And I mean that's the thing that was that was my my hope of of you know <laughs> getting into radio was to be able to do audio sketch comedy the way so many other great you know people like the uh, credibility gap and the committee and fire sign theater and in Chicago we had uh, the usual suspects who were old Second City guys that were doing really yep. great comedy at WXRT and I'm like oh this will be great Orkin. Dick Orkin of course Chicken Man and Rich Coz uh, used to write for Dick Orkin for. One of That's the right. iterations of Chicken Man. Oh yeah, man. So well, anyway, I'm blanking on on Orkin sidekick for Bert something. It was Orkin and and I thought it's I thought the or no no it was Dick Orkin yeah and it, I think Bert I want to say was the other guy, but they're Dick not Bert sounds right. Yeah, they went too. Yes, and and Orkin still does a lot of advertising. I don't know if if Bert is still right. in the game or not. I'm not sure. But uh, I, I, I haven't heard anything from him in a while. I don't know. He was still active doing ads, and every now and then I'll see, I'll hear it, and I'll think eh, it feels like it might be Orkinish, or frankly, he was doing um, the voiceover of commercials they were creating for the various local employment dot com things for years. Oh sure. So when I lived out when I lived out uh, in Connecticut while working in New York. I would hear his voice for FairfieldEmployment.com. <laughs> like that's Dick Horton. <laughs> See, that's how big a fan of radio you've tapped a vein. I like it. That's all right, man. This is what I do on the show. Is a lot of times we'll get into tangents of uh, of things that creators like beyond comics and stuff. But I'm going to steer it back to comics and especially you because um, 
There's a few things I wanted to ask you about beyond your current work for Archie. And one of them, of course, was, as we've said, your association with DC. And um, it's been interesting because you've edited Mark and Mark has edited you over the years in, in various uh, projects, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, Mark less so because he went on to uh, to writing full time a lot quicker than I did. And um, but yes, he edited Gotham by Gaslight, my breakthrough. Yes, indeed. And I want to talk about that, obviously, the the first Elseworlds. And mm-hmm. uh, it was a groundbreaking. Not that we comic. knew that. Well, and I understand. You know, I want to I want to hear the the origins of, of Gotham by Gaslight, because I, I bought it off the stands and it certainly blew my mind and became this uh, other imprint that uh, DC went to for years uh, beyond that. But t- yeah, tell me about the, the origins of Gotham by Gaslight. While we were both uh, sort of uh, not junior, I think we were associate editors at DC. Mark and I uh, shared an office for a while and we were um, fairly great friends almost immediately, uh, largely because Mark was a smaller guy who needed protection um, because his mouth often got him into trouble. (laughs) I don't think he would uh, deny that. Um, so, you know, it was, it was one of these, you know, Androcles and the, uh, uh, and the lion, uh, stories in reverse. He stuck a, a thorn in his own paw and I pulled it out, uh, at a, at our first big editorial, uh, get together. He wandered into territory where he was being accused of something he hadn't done. I mean, something petty, but the boss of the company was like, Mark, you started that and I wanted to stop. And I just stood up and said, Mark didn't start it, didn't have anything to do with it. And then, you know, that backed off. And again, it was just a casual kind of, I knew perfectly well. I barely knew the guy, but I was a lot taller than almost everybody in the space. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I could, uh, I could demand some credibility, I guess. Um, but having, having, you know, for all of that, we realized we were similar of similar minds. We, we loved all the same comics and so on. Um, you know, we were, we were definitely of the second generation of the fan turned pro, um, uh, Marv Wolfman, Len Wein, guys like that, Roy Thomas mm-hmm. were the first, but, um, by the time we got there, almost all of the folks working at DC, the, the younger editors and creators were, you know, inculcated. That sounds nasty, maybe even dirty, but we're, uh, we're, we're sort of grown, buy comics into comic fans and then pros. And, you know, we were no different and maybe a little worse because we were sort of rabid. Mark can name, you know, issue numbers and titles. I'm not that good. (laughs) Or maybe I'm not that bad. But uh, anyway, we bonded quite well. And uh, he was editing a book called Secret Origins, which was an anthology title. Yes. And... uh, you know, in his in his first, end of first year, beginning of the second year, they gave him an annual. And this was right about the time that he had, in the regular monthly title, had just done, you know, the Superman family and the Batman family. And I have an annual. Who can I go to? What's special? And he, you know, because he'd already done, just done all of the big names. And so, yeah. Uh, he's pacing the office and he's like, what do I do? What do I do? And he goes home and he lived in New Jersey and I lived in Connecticut and I get a phone call and, uh, and you know, like eight o'clock at night, he goes, I don't know that I have an answer yet, but I think I'm onto something. What if we did for my annual, I did alternate universe origins. Now about that time, alternate, um, alternate universe fiction was sort of, in the beginnings of things guys like Harry Turtle love were doing a sort of what if the Sal had won the war and things yes. like that. And so in science fiction, that was a, a cutting edge at the moment. And I said, well, that, that sounds like a great idea. Cause then you could do Superman's origin, but you can alter something or a lot and, uh, and retell it. And as we talked, we realized whatever the alternate well, alternate was, it shouldn't go too far. It shouldn't just, be a license to make it a different character that it needs to be that if you do Superman's origin in a different context, 
he should still be essentially Superman because these are our heroes and they should rise above whatever their circumstances to be their essential hero-ness. Sure. And so we talked around, talked around, talked around. What would I do with Batman? He said, and I, we batted, batted around for a while. And I said, well, wait a minute. What if, you know, Batman is this Gothic character. What if we put him in the reality of Gothic America in the you know Victorian age? And he goes, um, okay, what, what would he do? And I said, well, he'd, you know, he'd be in the, you know, the 1880s, 1890s, and he'd be, uh, it's a hundred years ago and he'd, um, um, well, he'd fight Jack the Ripper, of course, <laughs> pure top of the head stuff, pure an hour and a half of talking to Mark Wade off the top of my head stuff. So we were spinning and my head was spinning and it just came off, peeled off. And he, I expected him to say, eh, no, <laughs> but he said, yeah, oh, wait, think about that. That could be something cool. Uh, then he realized he had to have dinner and that we were talking in the morning. So as soon as I hung up the phone, I sat down at the typewriter, which is, <laughs> this is a day slightly before computers. And I typed up a, a page of pitch for that story. And so he needed to get that approved. He needed to get the idea of alternate origins approved. And so we went to Dick Giordano, who was our mentor boss and the editor in chief. And he said, uh, you can do that if you want, but, this story should be a standalone. Find the right artist, and this can be a, you know, whatever they were calling graphic novels. The prestige format back then that I yeah, mean, there was yeah, right. the, yeah, the the precedent was already already there from Dark Knight Returns and Mike Mike Grell's Longbow Hunters with Green Arrow, but yeah, it was still special enough. So, so yeah, how did you guys uh, decide upon, or, or how did Mike uh, Mignola uh, get involved? Well, it's weird. I, I, you know, my memory may be faulty, and I'm sure that this isn't the case exactly, but it's very close. I want to remember that we walked out of Dick's, uh, Dick's office, and in the ante room, you know, where his assistant sat, he, and Mark and I were like, who would be the, the right artist? And, you know, we, and we rattle off a couple of names and, you know, we were like, oh, yeah, that could be. Well, we have, OK, we can call that person. And we stepped. Noah. And Mike, at that point, had done a little bit here and there. And he was he was in the office to deliver the last of his cosmic odyssey sure. to Mike Carlin. Yes. And we certainly knew his work. And it was literally like one of those Laverne and Shirley, you know, in walk, you know, uh, Lenny and Squiggy. It was a perfect timing of, <laughs> you know, we stepped out and and uh, Mike was in the hallway and, you know, hello, Lavine. Exactly. And, hello. Uh, <laughs> and he said, Mike said, uh, whatever you're pitching, I'm too busy. I have a commitment at Marvel. I don't have time to do anything else. And we said, just listen. And we took him into our shared office. We closed the door and Mike said, uh oh. And we did this kind of rope-a-dope thing with, you know, we were playing, you know, bad cop, nuts cop, and we were just pitching it back and forth. And uh, Mike's listening, and he every now and then would say, oh, that's really interesting. I wish I had time for it. I don't have time for it. And we pitched some more, and we kept, you know, and we at that moment, we were improvising scenes from the story that didn't exist. You know, we can have the, the and we were, trying to play to Mike's strengths. I, uh, you know, uh, it's too early for automobiles. So I'm envisioning a chase scene with a horse. Mike likes to draw horses. <laughs> and of course it all comes down to a scene in the graveyard with these, you know, and at some point Mike offers an alternate, alternate take on a scene. He says something like, or you could blah, 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 blah and offers a, a better version of this visual. And then he stops and we stop and we're all looking at each other for, I don't know, somewhere between three seconds and three and a half hours. And Mike looks at us sad eyed and says, Oh, bleep. I'm doing this thing. Aren't I? <laughs> he didn't say bleep, but I don't know. <laughs> what. 
parameters of your podcast. No, huh? you can you can swear if you want to. It's up to you, buddy. <laughs> what you said was, "Oh fuck, I'm doing this, aren't I?" <laughs> having to which having we could only reply, "Are you?" <laughs> and he said, "Yes." Well, I you know I mean that's the thing, and now uh, certainly you know this is this is before Hellboy, but certainly what he's done with BPRD seems to be in that same wheelhouse of. Uh, and the history of BPRD and the, the history of Abe Sapien and, and the like, I mean, it, it kind of fits, uh, you know, that that's well, milieu. He he was the only artist who, who really would have fit. We came up with people who would have done great jobs, but there's nobody who loves, like, say, for instance, Gothic architecture or or that kind of mood. I mean, and, and Mike has since yeah. proved this, Screw but at the very early part of his career... Um, this is really the first thing he got to do, uh, and he has said this, in his style. Yes. I mean, he did Rocket Raccoon and, and Cosmic Odyssey. He did a really nice job for heroes and things like that that weren't his first love. He certainly loved comics in general, loves comics in general. But his his real, his wheelhouse, if, if we use that term, um, was, you know, light and dark and things of the shadow and creatures of the night. And he, he's, he turned out to be perfect and happenstance was on our side. All of this was, you know, all these dominoes tipping over that were nowhere near each other. Uh, it was just a great, and again, it may not have all happened in the same morning, but doggone it. It makes a good story. And that's how I remember it, but it did come together really quickly. Dude, it's it's like I said. I mean, obviously, it is a classic comic, and and also uh, a a good sequel to that comic as well. Uh, Master of the World, right? Wasn't that the mm-hmm. sequel? Right, Master and of the Future. Master of the Future. Excuse me. I knew it was close to the Jules Verne uh, title and everything. So, well, I ripped I ripped off Verne extensively for that. So, good 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 uh, source material to to kind of you know. Start at it and, and do your own thing and everything. So Mike Mike didn't draw Master of the Future, correct? He uh, he got even more famous as a result of Gotham by Gaslight. Um, well, I had to go on to that Marvel project, Wolverine project, that got delayed. And uh, I don't think he ever stopped working. So he was just way too busy. And I'm not sure that uh, – I, mean, I think we would have come up with something different as a sequel if Mike was aboard. I kind of catered the story to the artist and uh, Ed Barreto. Ed- Eduardo had Barreto, this of course. Beautiful, illustrative yes. style. Yes. So, keeping it in era, I wanted to do a lot more daytime, um, a lot more uh, period detail and things that he would just love to draw and did love to draw. So, we did it, uh, we set it in the. Uh, the first one took place a hundred years prior to publication. So the Gotham, I guess I was 1889 and the second one was 1892. Okay. 93. Sure. Okay. Coming up on, Oh, the uh, Colombian exposition made a slightly altered, um, made a, an appearance, um, based on obviously Chicago's Colombian exposition of, of, 18, of 1894. And, in, and they in kind fact, of- I sent, him a lot of postcards and things with images of of that fair. That's really cool, and it and it seemed to me that the animated Gotham by Gas like movie kind of combined the stories a bit and and gave it that that World's Fair, dro- you know, backdrop and everything. Have Have you seen the animated film? Well, of course, yeah. No, I was sort of know, part of it all along. Yeah, and, well, um, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I, you know, a what you. Because they took, I mean, they, they, they changed a few things uh, from your story. And some, and some choices I would not have made and some choices that I'm actually very pleased with. Um, the inclusion of uh, Selena Kyle. Kyle yeah. Uh, I thought that was brilliant. I loved that. Um, I'm not sure that I would, I don't think I could have wound up and I'm not sure that I love the, the mystery villain. Or Understood. the mystery of the villain. For people who haven't seen it, we, um, will, we, will, we won't reveal. But yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm being year. careful not to. I, you know, honestly, but, man, um, I didn't even. I I only saw it because I bought into the streaming service, and I noticed mm-hmm. that it was on there. And I'm like, oh, you know, I haven't I haven't seen that DVD, and it's on the it's on the 
DC Universe streaming service. I'm like, what the hell? I'm going to watch it. And and knowing that I was going to talk to you, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to see the differences and everything. So let me see what they did. I, I liked it. I liked it. I liked it. My, I mean, frankly, they had me. At, we want to adapt it. So I, mean, <laughs> I was I was thrilled. Um, you know, if if the t- if the disc had ruptured after my credit on screen, I would have been OK. <laughs> <laughs> But there are big, big, big letters for my name and, and Mike's name. Um, yeah, I mean, they had to combine the two or invent more stuff because the original is a 40, I think a 45 page graphic novel. Yep. And this is a 90 some minute of film. And frankly, I'm flattered fully that they uh, went to the uh, second one and borrowed the fair as a background and it all fits together as a piece. And, uh, like I said, I, I may not have made all the same choices, but I was pleased overall. And given the uh, uniqueness of Mike's artwork, I thought they did a decent job of animating it, given that Mike's stuff is probably not that easy to animate. I understand. I mean, the, I, yeah. I, even the Hellboy um, animations have been, you know, the, the characters have been a little bulkier, and you know, Mike's characters tend to be sort of hunched and creepy <laughs> as they're supposed to be. Uh, but getting that to move, maybe not as easy as anything, but thought they did a decent job. They captured mood and, and again, they score a lot of points. The screenwriter whose name escapes me um, scores a lot of points just for getting Selena Kyle and getting her um, right. And, and right for the time. So, yeah, I, yeah, I thought it was a real a, a good adaptation. Again, with the changes that they made, I, I I can appreciate you know that yeah you might have gone a different way in, on a couple things. I'll tell you, it, it did a lot better, and and also adding to the story in a way that I think uh, as much as they tried to do a, a good job with the killing joke, I, I felt like a lot of the the new stuff that Azarello brought to the script just didn't it didn't fit it didn't fit from uh, at least my my own opinion. Is on, he the one who did the adaptation? Yeah, yeah, and he, you know that that prelude, pro, uh, prologue that they do with Bat Batgirl before they get down to the Alan Moore story. It was the same problem. It's a, you know it's a forty plus page story. You're not going to be able to fill seventy to ninety minutes, you know, with just that. You need more. But yeah, I just right. you know it, they they felt like two different stories, and and mm-hmm. as opposed to what what I think we got with the Gotham by Gaslight adaptation, I thought I thought it was pretty. I cool. agree. It was of a piece. It was of a piece. Yeah. When I first heard, thanks to Killing Joke, when I, the first thing I heard about this, it had been rumored for a while. I hadn't gotten the thumbs up yet from DC Warner. So the very first thing I heard was a friend of mine who's a Hollywood insider said, um, so I hear they've, uh, they're going forward with the uh, Gotham by Gaslight. That's cool. Okay, that's cool. And they've cast and named the actress who was going to uh, to uh, play to voice Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, Catwoman, uh-huh. Selena Kyle, and I went, oh, okay, and I didn't know the name, but my friend rattled off a couple of credits, and I said, oh no, I said, that's she's got a great sound, great voice, and she's perfect, and blah blah, and then it dawned on me, wait, wait, Catwoman's not in my story, <laughs> <laughs> and so I spent a brief moment worried that. You know, she and Batman would have sex on a roof, and uh, exactly. Yeah. So you know, I, I got, I got, a, I got, I came off much better. Is it Jennifer Garner? I'm looking at the. Uh... It's Jennifer something, but it's not Garner. No, it might okay, be Gardner. Yeah, all right, I, yeah, I th- it is something like Gardner because, um, I like I said, I literally I rewatched it this morning to be you know kind of set with it and everything and and be able to talk to you about the differences. Yeah, because um. But I'm and of course you know you you can't you can't trust uh, the internet sometimes so I'm sure they made a mistake. I thought Bruce Greenwood did a great job. As oh, he's Batman. perfect. Perfect. I'm, I, I'm perfect a huge voice. fan of his, and for a long time. I mean, even yep. Nowhere Man back in the '90s, his uh, kind of prisoner esque uh, UPN uh, television show I thought was really good. That's right. That's right. So yeah, no, and, and a, he, good Batman, decent Batman. And I think he's done Batman once, maybe once before for the animation. But in just in general, he has a voice that goes with his square jawed face and and you know handsome face and now nah, he was great i couldn't have asked for for better the voice talent overall was quite good 
Had you um, had you been thinking and back to the comic about uh, possibly a third story? Indeed, yes. I mean, um, like I say, I tailored the second the second one to the strengths and interests of the artist. So Eduardo, you know, the first one is a, a was going to happen, and Mike was perfect for it. Mm-hmm. So there's, I can't say that I planned it for Mike, but it turned out he was perfect. Barreto was uh, had a very illustrative style. Um, he loved to do historical stuff. He had done a Shadow Strike set in the 30s for me. Yes. Oh, wow. I didn't uh, know you had written that. I do remember him drawing. I know. The show. I, I, wow. I edited. I edited it. So. Oh, okay. Uh, so I gave him a chance to do because again, here's a guy who did, you know, Titans after Perez and, you know, Batman and Superman stuff here and there. But what he really loved was you know, pulp style and more, uh, his heroes were more of the classic illustrators. So when I, when we came to the fact that we were going to be doing this second story, Ed said he wanted to. And so I tailored it to make sure there was plenty of, you know, the kind of things he likes struck costuming and daytime, um, shots of architecture and, um, you know, and it was very definitely influenced by Jules Verne. So my uh, my thinking was that the third one would be with yet another artist. I don't know who. Um, but if the first one was a psychological horror story, the second one was a sci- sort of Victorian science fiction story, the third one would have been yet again something, um, you know, tonally consistent, but um, a different variation, a different, slightly different change in genre. Um, so I was thinking that the third one would have been um, something that tied in with Lovecraft. Oh, cool. So I had, I had a a three paragraph pitch that we were working towards. And, uh, and then the Elseworlds floor broke uh, under the weight of Batman and the Peloponnesian war. And, (laughs) and who knows what all. Oh yeah, it's Mark, no, it... Mark's a go, Mark Wade's go-to joke. I gotta give him that. <laughs> but there were some good um, ones, and there were some that were just seemed to be for the sake of slapping an Elseworlds, uh, you know, uh, imprint on it and everything. But yeah, because there were there were there were some really interesting ideas over the years on the Elseworlds. Oh, I agree. That, you know... I agree. The, the Civil War one, the Batman Blue and Gray was was interesting. I'm not sure. You know, I'm not always sure that the character that the Batman aspect of the character fit, but they, but, uh, Elliot Nagin, the writer found a way to make the, the secret identity thing, identity thing work in a, in the sense of a spy, you know, spy operation yeah. during the war. Yep. Um, and quite a number of them. I read Rain, mm-hmm. the vampire. Yeah. That's uh, a lot absolutely. of it was quite good. Kelly Jones. And even yeah, some man. of the later ones were, were pretty good. I liked Superman I Red Sun. Of course, Mark Miller's uh, Red Sun is amazing. Absolutely. I remember a good Justice League one that kind of played with that late 1890s, early 1900s Edison Tesla kind of era of wonder. And I can't remember the writer or the artist, but it just was like seeing the Justice League at the turn of the century like that. Right. Uh, wonder Woman was wearing kind of a corset and a and a, a gathered hoop skirt or something. Yeah, I remember the... Yep. Somebody interesting, you know, somebody very capable of that kind of period um, art. Uh, I'm blanking on who now. Phil Winslade, somebody like that. And uh, you know, I think it might have been actually Phil Winslade. Now that you say that, I yeah, think that, that that's I have a decent it. memory. I have a decent memory for somebody who's about to go see now. So <laughs> I feel I feel pretty good about that. But yeah, there was a lot of them, and it, and even if they'd all been excellent, um, you know that that race was kind of nearing its end. And so we got shelved, never did find the, an artist that would have been worth it. And I had developed a basic structure of the story. And so it would have been, you know, five years after the 18, you know, so it'd been like right at the turn of the century of the last century. And, uh, Gotham was, uh, beginning to dig way tunnel. And, Found something living on the group. <laughs> That's cool. So that would have been an outright horror story. Very cool. I just read Neil Gaiman uh, did a uh, Sherlock Holmes meets uh, H. H. P. Lovecraft kind of story 
Um, I think Dark Horse uh, put it out, but I, I read that in the oh. last couple of weeks, and it was it was pretty interesting. And yes, yeah, so look into it. Was was the phrase steampunk around when you guys? No, no. Okay, that's yeah. I mean, that's the other interesting thing is you know steampunk before steampunk, really. Well, we didn't. I mean, it, by literal definition, we're 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 not steampunk. Okay. There, it, it, we are we are Victorian. We are historical. True. Yes. But in Gotham by Gaslight, there there are no gadgets that were. I mean, to me, steampunk, and I'm not putting it down by any means, but it it is a a sort of branch of science fiction that depends not only on using the period, but to sort of do Wild Wild West style. I'm with you. Absolutely. Imposing yes, technology didn't exist um the closest we come is in the second one the uh, the guy in the, the the master of the future the guy who runs the blimp the pilot of his blimp is an automaton but even that while while it is clockwork punk i suppose um that's based on on on, on available technology from time Sure. No, I understand. Yeah, and and you're simple, right. Simple task robots existed. They would deal cards, um, things like that. So, in fact, he is based on a a French uh, magician's robot called uh, Antonio Diavolo. So, <laughs> I, you cool, know, man. I know where to rip off good stuff. I like it. That's awesome, man. Too funny. Um, I, what's coming up? Is there uh, beyond uh, Archie nineteen forty one? What else have you got in the uh, hopper? I am glad to say that uh, that I have become a favorite son um, over there at Archie, and and they are we are talking um, primarily uh, because they love me more than they love Mark. Um, <laughs> no, primarily because Mark is so committed to a thousand things, um, and also they they I work very closely, and they they know who I am, what I can do. Um, one of my greatest, one of the greatest moments of working for them, aside from growing up on Archie, the comic book and Archie, even the comic strip, which is in a new what paper carried it. The Chicago American carried the Archie strip. Oh, wow. Okay. Sure. The Hearst papers. And then that became Chicago today. And yes, I think that's that, what I remember. I today, Chicago today continued to run. They were reading all those comic strips, the Tribune as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was a big fan of, uh, I'm a big fan of comic John Radar. In fact, one of the coolest things when I was. Say it one more time, Mark, because uh, you you kind of, you dropped out for a second. So you're you're a big fan of what? I'm a big fan of comics in general, of course. I love comic books um, and comic strips and everything that's part of our, our deal. And Archie, just because, like Superman and Batman, Archie is an icon of, of pop culture. Sure. So it was a, it was a big privilege to work for this company, and uh, so they have come to me and said, pitch other things, and I've got one or two things that they're taking seriously. So there's that. I'm finishing up a, uh, a trilogy that I'm doing uh, for Lady Mechanica, once again into steampunk and. Um, Victorian era for uh, Joe Benitez, um, wherein he, the partially mechanical lady detective, meets a Victorian era Avenger of the Night superhero. I never throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And you know, and I've got I've got feelers out, and I've had a had one call. So there are things that are happening. That's awesome, man. Well, come back because let me just let me let me circle yeah. back around to the oh, steampunk because I want to I want to say this they have out here in the Phoenix area there is a, a an enormous steampunk appreciation society or whatever and uh, starting at some of the earlier local conventions I did I became sort of an embraced uh, you know unofficial member because they were convinced that I had been part of the invention of steampunk and. You know, I said, well, you know, technically not really. Well, you're working in the same period, they said, and they were very generous to, uh, you know, to give a lot of credit that frankly wasn't due. <laughs> but I was glad. I mean, I even met uh, the first um, 
version of the uh, Gaslight Batman costume uh, cosplay in one of their members who had essentially done the the sum total of his contribution of outright steampunk was that he put goggles on the mask. So, (laughs) like I said, I love I love that that this stuff. I've read a bunch of. uh, uh, you know, short stories that uh, that do a really nice job with that, and I'm glad to be embraced. But we're we're at the very edge of, of having no legitimate claim. But I'm happy for it. I'm with you, man. No, no, I get it. But it, that's that's cool, and I'm glad you're able to lean into it with Lady Mechanica. That's that's terrific, and I'm really glad that Archie's listening to your uh, ideas. I, you got to come back because uh, we didn't talk about the Flash. And your long association with the Flash, I, uh, yes. I would, I would love to talk to, about that in a future conversation. And uh, no, congratulations, man! I, I really like uh, Archie nineteen forty one when it was announced. I, I uh, immediately contacted Mark because he's been on a million times, and we're friends. And uh, he said, "Yeah, but you yes, got to talk to Brian." And I'm like, "Okay, yeah, sure." <laughs> he recommended you guys to me too. So oh, that's really nice. I had already checked out some of your online casts and so on. Oh, thanks. Um, there's plenty to talk about. I love Flash from 1963 when I discovered the comic, and then I got to grow up and be Julius Schwartz myself. But <laughs> absolutely, man, writing and editing the character. No, I'd love to talk about that in a in a future conversation. So yeah, when uh, when there's something new, uh, please let me know, and I and if something catches my eye, I, I'll, I'll contact you. But uh, yeah, I hope this is. Uh, the first of many conversations with you, Brian. I, I thank you for your time today. Hey, we're we're landsmen. We're exactly we're local man. Boys. Damn straight, absolutely. So that'd be great. No, I re- I really appreciate your time today, man. Uh, thank you very much. No, thank you for uh, including me in. That's great. You do run a good show, a great show, and good luck. I podcast a little bit here and there. I love doing it. What's I your get podcast? My radio on. Promote promote well, your podcast. Well, we're we're in hiatus, but I was doing something called sort of a big show. Okay. Um, based around the idea that I used to humorously bill myself as sort of a big deal. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm no Mark Wade, but I'm sort of a big deal. Is your feed, we, is your feed still on iTunes and everything? Um, I don't think we ever got to iTunes. It was on SoundCloud for a while. Okay. But our, uh, our producer went out or moved away from, okay. uh, from our reach and we're, uh, we're refiguring the show, but you know, like I said, I got to get my radio on finally. At a point, absolutely, man. If only we could get rights to songs, I'd be spinning, I'd be spinning the platter and spilling the. <laughs> like Mike Gold, Mike Gold was doing uh, was DJing, uh, doing some internet radio DJing for a while too. So. Yeah, I know if he still is, but yeah, he did. Uh, as the, that's, you see, so. <laughs> Well, cool, man. It's all oh, very incestuous. I hear you. And no, and you know, it's funny when when you were talking about when we were doing our radio memories. I wanted to bring up Mike uh, earlier in the conversation and everything, and say, hey, you know, we're, uh, you know, there's another guy in comics that uh, has his radio background and everything. We always talk about Chicago well, radio. I, you know, Mike had done a lot of it. I like I yeah. said, I just uh, I I lusted for it, but I you know went off and got a different degree. So you know, there you go. That's all right. You know, and again, it like is. I told you, radio, radio today. You know, you're better off doing podcasting because you can do the you can do the show that you always wanted to do without uh, having uh, some program director have to greenlight it and everything. So, <laughs> well, I treat it as though it were a talk show. Cool. I have my my newsman sidekick and me, and we, you know, rip on pop culture. We rip we rip on some pop culture, <laughs> but uh, politics, pop culture, and so on. I understand, man. No, that's awesome. Well, and and when you're ready to fire that up, let me know, and what we can direct Word Balloon listeners uh, to hear your podcast as well. Well, it's going to be a roundtable thing next. And all we have to do is figure out who's bringing the uh, the engineer. So we're very I, close. I'll let you I know. I understand. Yeah, please do, man. No, it was a real pleasure, dude. I, I, I thank you very much for doing this tonight. Well, give my regards to the big city and. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you dropped out, are you there? Yeah. Okay, you said give my regards to the big city, and then I lost you, so. Oh, I said, and go have an Italian beef for me. There you go. <laughs>
There you go, Brian Augustine, Archie 1941, is out there now. Pick up the back issues and uh, k- catch up with this great series from Archie. I'm enjoying it, and I'm telling you, it's really, really entertaining. Great art from Peter Krauss, uh, a really great production, and uh, a very interesting story and uh, take on the Riverdale gang. I hope you enjoyed today's Word Balloon. It was brought to you again by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your continued support. If you'd like to subscribe to Word Balloon, you can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon or click on the ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. Thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Lightning Strike Comics, the Irish comic book publisher behind such titles as The Life and Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Prince Valiant 80th Anniversary Magazine, Highlander the Commemorative Movie Magazine, and many more titles... And, of course, their new series, The Phantom Strikes, featuring Alex Saviak and David Williams doing the writing. Really interesting stuff. To order the copies for this new series, you can visit lightningstrikecomics.com. Retailers can make bulk orders by emailing, by emailing them at info at lightningstrikecomics.com. Check it out. The new book, The Phantom Strikes, featuring Alex Saviak and David Williams from Lightning Strike Comics. Thanks again for listening. We have another episode out there today. I hope you listen to it. It's Bob Greenberger, a great comics historian who has two incredible coffee table books just in time for holiday season, and you should really consider them. Uh, DC Superheroines, 100 Greatest Moments, and The Justice League's 100 Greatest Moments. Really great. A great concentration of comic book history in two amazing books. We talk about those and a lot more. Bob Greenberger on the uh, other episode that is released today on Word Balloon. I hope you listen. Thanks a lot for listening always. Thank you very much, League of Word Balloon listeners, for your support. Fly high, Junior Birdman. Uh, We're in the uh, holiday season. We're getting there. I know, man. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to rush the holidays. I consider Thanksgiving one as well. So we're on the march to Thanksgiving, and uh, that's good. And that means that there's some great episodes coming up for November. Uh, Already people, very interesting uh, people lined up few other episodes already in the can can't wait to share them with you on word balloon so thanks for listening check back with me at the end of the week until then word balloon is a copyright feature of shaky productions copyright 2018is as much fun as giving them. Get in the holiday spirit with matching PJs and loungewear. For everyone who asks for slippers, we have great styles for him and her. Why not slip a shaving kit in his stocking? But hurry in, they're going fast. And if you've got techies and music lovers on your list, we've got their gear. From electronics to headphones, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas at Macy's Backstage. Off price, on trend, arriving daily. Find your store at Macy'sBackstage.com. North Pole Hotline, Mrs. Claus here. Help! Sherpas are on everyone's list this year. Santa, get to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yup, the entire store's on sale with up to 60% off Sherpa popovers from $15 and gifts from three bucks. Three bucks? Plus, tomorrow only, you don't even need your sleigh. When you buy online and pick up in-store, you'll get a free round-trip lift voucher to Old Navy to get your gifts. I'm ho-ho hurrying to Old Navy for up to 60% off. Valid 1213 to 1219. Exclusions apply. Lift voucher valid 1215 only. Terms at lift.com slash Old Navy.